Hello, magical unicorns. Welcome back to another episode of the Magical Mess Podcast. I am your host, Muriel Edward, also known as the Hazy Unicorn. And today's show topic is Mothers and Daughters. Today's show is going to really take a glimpse at mother-daughter relationships and how they have the power to affect us even in our adulthood. It is crazy. But I'm going to warn you in advance, this is going to be a longer show, something that you might want to sit back and have maybe a cup of tea, cup of coffee as you digest the information because it's a lot. So before we get started, I'd like to get started with our meditative moment. This is an opportunity to wind down, relax, connect with self before we get into the topic. Here we go. See you soon. Wasn't that awesome? I really needed that, especially with today's show topic, because it hits really close to home. So I needed that meditative moment, maybe a little bit more than you guys. Before we get started, I must say firmly that I am not in any way, shape, or form a licensed therapist. What I am is a woman that has gone through some challenging circumstances and sought out professional help of a therapist, as well as traveled over 10,000 miles across the world to Bali, Indonesia, in order to learn about meditation and how to develop my own practice in order to overcome my own personal shit. Um, And it's my desire to really share my truth with you in hopes of inspiring you and everybody else to live their truth. Because really and truly, we all go through stuff. We don't realize it because we're busy going through it. And a lot of people sometimes are busy denying it. But I personally believe that when you go through your stuff and you realize how you are either complicit in the stuff, how you were a victim in the stuff, or however it went, you can totally overcome it and find your magic. And that's what we are here to do today. So today's topic is going to discuss my personal relationship with my mother and... You may hear me pause a lot because there was a lot of thinking that I had to go through in creating this. Because the mother-daughter relationship is hella important. Very, 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 very important. Right now, you may be thinking, oh, I just can't seem to get along with my mom. And that's perfectly fine. However, what I've realized is that It wasn't until I began understanding my mom, her personality, and why she does the things she does, the way she does it, that's when my life began to take a trajectory shift where it just started changing. Things that I never thought I could think or do, I just started doing them. But first and foremost, it's crazy. Like I felt like I had to go through a process of Hating my mom, understanding my mom, not liking my mom, loving my mom, and a whole bunch of stuff before I finally was able to find my stuff. It's crazy, but let's get started, guys. The mother-daughter relationship has the power to transform every other relationship with the women in your life. Without a healthy mother-daughter relationship, it's almost impossible to love and support your girlfriends, your sisters, your coworkers, whoever it may be. And... It's simply because we learn how to navigate our relationships with women from our mothers. I used to watch my mom with her sisters and her friends. And I used to be like, hmm, like, why is it that she seems closer with some people and she seems really like 
taken away from some people. However, when she's around them, she's calling them friends. She's saying, oh my goodness, you're my bestie or whatever. But I didn't see that behind closed doors. When we're young, we watch how our moms commune with the women in our lives and what either we pick up the same habits or we fight really hard to never want to be like them, which often brings us right back to being like our moms. It's crazy how that works. As long as you're going to fight being like your mom, you wind up being exactly like your mom. And that's something that I don't know. It's, it, it just works that way. And when it's all said and done, it's okay not to want a relationship with your mom, especially if it's toxic. But what helped me to understand myself was learning how to understand my mother from a distance. Like I used to distance myself from her a lot. Either I could be in the same room with her and not be connected to her and she would feel it because I wouldn't necessarily be giving her maybe the emotional love or or the affirmation or whatever it is that she needed. And so she would feel it. But I know that was after years of going through some stuff that we're going to get into. So with that being said, let's get started. If you've been listening to this podcast for some time, you know that since birth, I've always been the bright-eyed and bushy-tailed girl that simply loved the idea of love and sharing it freely with the people around me. I'd go out of my way to show love to my family members, friends, by making them gifts, writing them poems, and professing my love to them profusely. So I used to always be like, oh my goodness, I love you, daddy. I love you, auntie. Like just kind of sharing love because I was just that kid, that kid that was just in love with love. And I just liked making people feel good about themselves. On the flip side of that, my mother was the absolute opposite. When I was a kid, I'd tell her how much I loved her and she'd say, okay, Muriel, now make sure your bed is clean. Or that's nice, but if you love mommy, you'd listen to me when I speak. And I'd be like, what? Okay. But to the average person, her responses may seem harmless. But to the child that's been cultivating and sharing love endlessly, not hearing her say, I love you back, was like a man drowning and dying just to get a gasp of air. What I came to realize was that it wasn't my mom's fault because her Haitian culture had not taught her how important it is to give and share love with our children. She never learned that. She had never learned that growing up. When she, what she did learn growing up was that if she provided clothes, shoes, food, shelter, access to education, that was her showing love. And so... Even when I would tell her, like, mommy, how come you never say I love you? She's like, you should know I love you because I do X, Y, and Z for you. And still, that did not feel that desire to feel the love or even approval of my mom. So to her, I should have been happy to receive her love or the way she gave love, even though it always came with conditions. Her love always had strings attached to it. So for me... I learned how to receive love from people with conditions, with strings attached, even from men. So fast forward to my senior year in high school. By now, my mom had realized she could use my desire to be loved by her as a tool to get what she wanted from me. So she yielded that every time she needed me to do something for her. If she needed anything from me, she she would kind of give me the love that she felt that I wanted and take it away really fast. Do I think she was doing this intentionally? No, not at all. But like anything else, once you were around somebody close enough, you know what makes them tick. And so you kind of have the power to control them without you even knowing it. Though I hadn't realized it yet, I had subconsciously craved my mother's approval. I knew that I did not trust her. I'd go so far to even say that I hated her with a big capital H. And I say that without feeling any kind of remorse because that was how I felt back in those days. My senior year of high school, I applied to over 30 colleges all outside of New York City where I'm from just so that I can get away from her control. Because even though I wasn't aware of how she was doing what she was doing, because I wasn't, I wasn't that sharp yet, okay? I didn't have all this wisdom that I have now. However, I knew that I was feeling like she was controlling me by me always wanting to crave that desire to get approval from her. So please don't get me wrong. My mother was not physically abusive. 
It was more like verbal and psychological abuse than anything else. Sometimes people discount the effects of this kind of abuse because there are no visible scars. I counter that and say that even though the scars were not visible, they were very present in every thought that I had about myself and the way that I treated the people around me, even the way that I allowed people to treat me. Those scars were there. In my book, these scars last longer and the healing can only happen unless you realize that you have these scars. I would have preferred physical scars, to be honest with you, because at least that would have healed over time. However, with these psychological scars, with these verbal scars, I had to go through some shit. I had to meet bad men. I had to have bad friendships. I had to go through all of this before I realized that these were scars that I had from my mom. Moving on. After almost four years of living on campus, I dreaded the idea of having to go back home. Or would I be subjected to my mother's not-so-quiet judgments about me? Within my time away, I rarely went home. I'd visit friends and family during school breaks because I didn't want to have to face her. So you can imagine how hard it was going home after college When I got back to New York City, I looked for a job tirelessly because I knew that if I stayed in my mom's house, I'd lose my mind and that I'd begin to resent her. And I didn't want that to happen. After some time, I finally moved out. By now, my mother's and I's relationships had not improved much. I was fiercely independent, even to this day. I'm still the same way. I was fiercely independent, so even while I was at my mom's house, I'd pay rent since I was about the age of 16. I'd buy my own food, I'd take care of my own bills, just so I wouldn't have to ask her for anything. And if we ever got into any arguments or disagreements, I'd say, I don't ask you for anything. Pretty much saying, chick, you can't control me because I don't need anything from you. And that used to get under her skin. (laughs) I was really bad growing up. I wouldn't say I was bad, but I just stood up for myself. I didn't care who you were. Because I knew that if I asked her for something, it had to come with something else. I knew that anything she had to offer me came at a price. And I wasn't willing to pay her prices. Because sometimes they were too high. I couldn't afford them. This is not to make you think that my mother was some kind of monster. Because she wasn't. She really wasn't. What she was was a broken woman who had never been taught how to love by her own mother. And like anything else, you cannot teach what you don't know. Some people say, oh, you know, as as soon as you become a mother, you, you get this nurturing instinct and all that is true, 100%. Even though I have no children, I believe from the depths of my soul that all that is true. However, she also couldn't teach what was never deposited in her. She was nurturing. She was loving. She was all that. However, she had a streak in her that wanted control. About a year ago, while having a heart-to-heart conversation with my mom, she told me that her mother never held her as a baby until she was about eight months. I was like, what? That's effing crazy. Because you know I can't curse in front of my mom. Oh, that's a whole nother thing. No, that's not happening. <laughs> but but yeah, I was blown away when she said that. The first bond that a baby is supposed to have is with its mother immediately after birth. That's why once the baby comes out and the doctor places the baby on the mother's chest, is to create that heart-to-heart bond. But that never happened for her because her own mother didn't like to hold small children. So she was held and taken care of by her nanny. When I learned that, my mind was blown, seriously, because this explains so much. Now you see how the cycle got repeated or tried to be repeated. Getting back to the story, when I moved out, my mother was pissed. Like, she wasn't having it. She was pissed. If you know anything about Haitian culture, you know that Haitians don't like to be embarrassed. 
no, not happening. So to her, me moving out her house was not like, oh my goodness, my daughter is doing great things. She has a great job. She has, she's making great money and all that. No, <laughs> that wasn't the case. What she felt, she took it very personal and she felt like, like she's moving out, not married. She's, um, she's single. She's, she's had, getting her own place. That means that she's moving out in order to become this free woman. And you know how what they say about free women back in the day. It's like free woman. So someone who's loosey goosey and just looking to entertain all kinds of men. And I was like, what? I was like, no, I need my independence. That's why I'm moving out. Like I said, she was hella pissed and she didn't speak to me or come to my house for over a year. And that hurt me. It really did. At the time, my apartment was located one block from Haitian Macy's. For those of you guys who live in New York City or even outside of New York City, we know that Haitian Macy's is also known as Bobby's Department Store. My mother lived in that place. She'd find herself there every weekend shopping. Bobby's is like the the place that has everything that you ever need for your house. It has clothes. It has linens. It has everything you could ever need for your house, for your own personal self. It has everything. So my mom found herself there every weekend. So Bobby's was one block away from my house. You know how much it hurt me knowing that my mother was right down the block from my house shopping each and every Saturday and refused to come and visit me or see where I lived every fucking weekend? Are you kidding me? I can say that now because I moved on from that hurt. But it took a very, very, very long time. But I have. It's no joke. That's really effed up. However, because I didn't do the things that she wanted me to do. So that was her way of holding back her love or approval of me or what I would decided to do. Finally, after years of running away from my mom, I had to face her in order to overcome my own shit. Some time ago, we were having a discussion and it got really heated really fast. Anyone who knows me will tell you that I am a cold cucumber on the warmest of days. I don't allow people and their mess to get to me. But on that day, I don't know if Mercury was in retrograde or if I was totally out of my mind, but my mother said the wrong thing to me. I can't even remember what it was at this moment, but she did. And all I saw was red. All I know is that I stood up from my seat. I stood toe to toe with the woman that gave me life. And I was about to put the poles on her. One thing I'm going to tell you is that my mother ain't no punk, okay? This this is where I got it from, so she ain't no punk. She stood up toe-to-toe with me, and she she gave me a look like, I dare you. As a matter of fact, she said it. She said, Miriam, I dare you. I dare you to do something. I took the deepest breath that God would allow me to take, and I walked away. Let's pause here for a second. No one in my life has ever gotten me to this place of anger, frustration, fury, and craziness. Like, I was really crazy enough to step to my mother. Are you kidding me? I legit stepped to my mother. I truly believe that my conscious self was like, yo, I'm tired of being pushed. I'm going to push back. Either way, the fact that she was able to get me there made me realize that I was not as independent as I thought I was. Because somehow she had the power to control me. She knew how to push the right buttons in order to get me to react all the time. She was my trigger. A lot of people believe that they're in control of themselves. However, if there's anyone out there who can make you act out of character, then you're not in control. Because there's somebody out there who can make you turn up, who can make you wild out. So you're not in control. I didn't like that my mom still had this control over me years later. That very day was the day I began looking for a therapist. I needed somebody to help me understand the power that she had over me and to help me in figuring out how to break the chain. Total side note, there is a dog that lives around the corner from me I live in a house, and so my house and the houses around the corner for me share a share backyard um, with the fence in the middle. And since I started this podcast, 
this dog has made it his or her mission to be on the track every single time. So what I've been doing is I've been editing the dog out. But sometimes that dog gets really loud. So if you ever hear a dog as I am speaking, that means that I either didn't edit it out or whatever the case is, or I didn't hear it. So just letting you guys know that I live in a real world where there's real people and I'm not in the studio. I am in my house recording and there's a dog that has made it his or her's mission to terrorize me. Now back to the story. After countless therapy sessions, I realized that my mother was also a victim. And like any other victim, you can either make a conscious choice to overcome or you become a victimizer yourself. And if you don't choose, you subsequently end up choosing the latter, which is what happened to her. As I record this podcast in March of 2018, I can say with 100% certainty that therapy changed my life. And it forever changed my relationship with my mother. Before therapy, I was just dealing with my mother, to say the least. I wasn't necessarily in relationship with her, but I was dealing with her. But the more I let go of past trauma with my mom, the deeper in love with her I fell and the more compassion I had for her. I've heard people say that when you change, it seems that the people around you begin to change. I so believe this to be true. My mom couldn't understand the changes that were happening to me and through me. Because when she'd say her offhanded comments about me, about my work or whatever, she'd sit back and wait for me to give her a reactive response, which is what I used to do. I used to be ready. It was almost like somebody who was always ready to fight. And so anytime she'd say some slick shit, I was ready like with the comebacks. However, this time now, after therapy or while going through therapy, she'd say her stuff and I'd sit back and I'd say, oh, hmm, okay. Or most times I wouldn't even acknowledge it and I would continue the conversation as if nothing happened. Other times she'd get more aggressive because when she realized that the original tactics weren't working, she'd get more aggressive and make judgments and comments about my attire, my weight, whatever it was in front of other people. And I'd simply say, thank you so much for the compliment and walk away. Slowly but surely, her words lost their power and she realized that. Her words were no longer effective. Her words couldn't get me to turn up. Her words couldn't get me to get upset or annoyed or, 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 or tell her how she hurt me. Her words just didn't mean anything to me anymore. Eventually, she began questioning me and asked me if I was upset with her. But in reality, I wasn't. So I'd say no. What I came to realize was that she was used to the combative dance that we engaged in. So when one person stopped dancing, the other person has to figure out what to do next. I had stopped dancing. I said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not doing this anymore. I believe that this is true for a lot of relationships in our lives and friendships. We get into a pattern of going back and forth with the people in our lives that claim to love us, and that becomes the norm in the relationship. So when one party decides that they no longer want to participate They're acting abnormal because the norm was that you say slick shit, I say slick shit, you say slick shit, I say slick shit. No, we're not saying that. I'm not saying anything. So from the bottom of my heart and the depths of my soul, I can say that I love my mother to eternity and back. I never thought that I'd be able to say that. And I always tell people she was my best teacher. Her lack of showing me love taught me how to find love within myself. Her lack of support of me taught me how to be creative and support and to create a supportive environment for myself and the other people around me. Her fierce drive and constant need to have me measure up made me the pit bull of a unicorn that I am today. My mother showed me a different kind of love and I wouldn't trade that love for the world because all that she showed me in what she didn't have allowed me to create the space, the compassion, the love, the faith, the promise that I have today. 
Anyone who knows me personally, I would put my life on it, will say that the minute they come around me, they feel transformed. Because the energy that I cultivated within myself radiates so much out of my skin, out of my pores, that you cannot come into my sphere of influence and not feel it. But this took work. Not just therapy, meditation, reading, books on personal development, um, listening to motivational stuff. It took years to get here right now. That's why I take this stuff so seriously. In the moment, while dealing with my mom, all I could feel for her was hate and resentment. I wanted a mom like Claire Huxtable or Aunt Viv on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I wanted so desperately to be loved by her. I wanted her to see just how much I love and care for her. In the moment, I had built up a wall so high that my mom could never reach over it to hurt me with her words or her projections. And so that wall, I allowed it to protect me from all the negative stuff that she would say. What I now realize is that my relationship with my mom fueled my mistrust for women. I had tons of friends and I still do, but can I honestly say that I trusted them? The answer is no. When I would see those women supporting women posts on IG and Facebook, I'd immediately think that's all good until one person start doing better than the other. This is my truth because that's what a lot of my past friendships were like. It would be all good until I start moving a little bit further. All of a sudden, things start changing. All of a sudden, you ain't ride and die no more. All of a sudden, I can't count on you even though I've been there forever and ever. I digress. What I've come to experience is that when I healed my relationship with my mom, I began attracting new friends. Friends that supported me. Friends that lift me up. Friends that do things for me. And this is a huge part of it because I never experienced that before. Without me even asking, people was doing stuff for me? What? That was new. That was brand new for me. They'd call me and check in, especially if I've been radio silent for a while because I'm known to do that. I, I get in my little box, I start doing work, and I don't speak to nobody for weeks. They hook me up with their business connections without making me feel as if they're doing me a favor. When I come into their circle of influence, everyone is telling me all the stories that my friend has shared with them about me and my successes. It's freaking surreal. I've never experienced that before. They say that we attract who we are. I was broken for a long time. So I attracted broken people. Now I'm happy. And I'm happy to say that I'm creating a tribe of women who heal each other, breathe life into each other, and who champion each other's successes. At this time, I'd like you to take a few moments to think about your own relationship with your mom. Or if you're a mom yourself, I'd like you to think about your relationship with your daughter. What is the legacy that you'd like to leave with your children's children's children? If you're a mom, are your actions in your relationship with your daughter congruent with that legacy? If you're a daughter, is there residual trauma that may be preventing you from achieving that legacy? Just think about that for a moment. With that information, we're going to collectively come together as one unit to forgive our mothers and restore our personal power back. With your eyes closed, I'd like you to take three deep breaths, holding each breath for five seconds, releasing them slowly. I'll join with you. I'd like you to repeat the following affirmation three times with boldness and conviction. 
Repeat after me. I forgive my mother for every action that she has done to me that has planted a traumatic seed in my being. I forgive my mother for every action that she has done to me that has planted a traumatic seed in my being. I forgive my mother for every action that she has done to me that has planted a traumatic seed in my being. This one affirmation has the power to break so many generational chains and heal generations to come. Next, we will reaffirm ourselves. Repeating the following affirmation three times with boldness and conviction. I am infinite potential. And in this moment, I release myself from all limitations as I choose to boldly embrace the totality of who I am. I am infinite potential. And in this moment, I release myself from all limitations as I choose to boldly embrace the totality of who I am. I am infinite potential. And in this moment, I release myself from all limitations as I choose to boldly embrace the totality of who I am. Now open your eyes. And wrap your arms around yourself, giving yourself a big hug. Congratulations. It is perfectly okay if you do not yet feel ready to forgive your mom. It took me a long time to get there. However, Use the second affirmation to begin the process of identifying the power that you've always had. Over the course of the next week, I'd like you to identify any other maternal-like relationships where you'd like to forgive that person and write it down. For example, if you were raised by a grandmother, auntie, sister, great-grandmother, or any other woman who acted in the role of a mom that you'd like to forgive. You're going to find a moment in a quiet place to meditate using the same affirmation we use today. I get so many students who say that they're not sure if they're meditating right. There is no right way to meditate. All you need to do is sit down, relax, and be quiet. So while holding the list of people in your hand, people to whom you want to forgive, I'd like you to say the name or names of the persons that you'd like to forgive out loud. And repeat the following affirmation three times. Then sit quietly meditating for five minutes, taking three deep breaths along the way. The affirmation is, I forgive, fill in the person's name here, for every action that she has done to me that has planted a traumatic seed in my being. You got that? I'll repeat it again. I forgive, insert the person's name here, for every action that she has done to me that has planted a traumatic seed in my being. At the end of the five minutes, you're going to tear up the list if you wrote it down or delete the list if you wrote it if you put it in your smartphone and give yourself a hug. You've just owned your mess. You're just that much closer to finding your magic. Before we end, I'd like to announce that my first book, The Hazy Unicorn, The Not So Perfect Guide to Mastering Meditation in 31 Days is now available for pre-order. Yay! To snag yourself a copy, go to www.thehazyunicorn.com. For a limited time only, the first 50 pre-orders come with an adorably cute hazy unicorn horn, which will be used during our Find Your Magic Meditation classes, which will soon be available online and throughout New York City. Also, I'll be having a VIP launch party in New York City, 
And if you'd like to be invited to the awesome night of magic and meditation, share a clip of yourself practicing your meditation practice with the hashtag Magical Mass Party. Be sure to sign up for our mailing list to find out where I'll be offering free meditation classes to find out more about the book, as well as an affirmation guide that is going to be released really soon. If you like this podcast, please be sure to leave a comment on Apple Music, Google Play, or whichever platform you're using to listen to it. I thank you guys for tuning in. Have a magical week filled with clouds and rainbows. Namaste.